Hey everybody, welcome to Data Engineers Lunch number 19. Um, today's topic is JQ, which is one of my favorite tools in the whole world that nobody knows about. And um, I'm glad that ARPAN is covering it today. I'm your organizer. I need help organizing this meeting and having maybe more speakers, looking for speakers, people to talk about different data operations, data engineering, data analysis, whatever you name it, everything around data. Data engineering is related to a lot of that stuff. Uh, we are part of a much broader community called Data Community DC, which is a nonprofit foundation that serves the DC metropolitan area. Uh, and beyond with uh, events on Zoom available to everybody. We are made up of data scientists, data analysts, statistical experts, um, full stack DC, which is full stack DC is full stack data science DC, uh, where they talk about everything, the API layer, the front end, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then Night Owls is a group that people can just hang out and co-work and get their side hustles going. Uh, what do we cover here? Well, we cover the get your shit together problem of data and to get it clean enough such that uh, it can be used by people, um, either by data scientists, data analysts, uh, or further you know, processing so that's usable by APIs um, that are then used by further processes. Anyone new on this call that would like to just say hi, who they are, uh, introduce themselves, and maybe tell us a little bit about how you work with data, what you want to learn here, or whatever. Just quick, quick uh, intro. Hi, I'm hey. Kitin. Hi there. Good afternoon and good evening from here in Europe. My name is Kitin, and actually, uh, I. Don't know where I saw your group, but I somehow find out and I thought, okay, let's join. And I live here in Netherlands and uh, I work right till now. I was working in one company called Aviva Software and now I left the company and uh, I'm now looking forward for the full time position in the data engineering field. I'm currently doing some data engineering projects as well. So yeah, I'm just mostly right now focusing on, you know, doing data engineering stuff. And yeah, I like it because I think this is the thing I want to do in my life. And I, the best thing is I enjoy it when I do it. So yeah, I'm looking forward to meet you all here and enjoy and talk to you guys. Great. Yeah, love to, love to talk to you. We always have work. So, you know, uh, why don't you send a note to um, who you see as a not corporation, who is the host of the meeting, you can send uh, Andrew your email address and maybe we can set up a time and chat to see if there's any projects that you could work on that we're working on. Cool, yeah, thank you, I will, definitely. Great, anyone else that wanna say hi, who they are, what do they do with data? All right, I'm not gonna pull anybody's seat. Uh, uh, this is Bob Weidlick. Hey, Bob. <clears throat> uh, so I'm a software engineer in the DC area. Uh, actually in uh, Virginia, and I work uh, with multiple customers, uh, kind of focusing on data science, machine learning, uh, uh, what used to be called big data, and just ETL and how to process data and stuff like that. Right now, I kinda, I'm kind of i focused on Python and using the JSON uh, module to parse, uh, uh, parse JSON and then push it. We're kind of focused on the AWS uh, machine learning stack. Uh, so I'm just... Uh, JQ looks like an a interesting alternative to that. So I'm kind of open to analyses of alternatives and things like that. So that's what motivates me here. Excellent. Glad to have you. Dinesh? Hi, hi Rahul. Uh, I work as a data warehouse developer. I uh, uh, have 13 plus years of experience. I'm trying to get into data engineering space, trying to learn myself and you know, joining the meetups uh, and uh, trying to learn from you guys. Um, I'm based out at Boston. Uh, yeah, throughout my career, I worked on data side, um, trying to get into data engineering space. Great, I'm glad you're here. There's a lot of um, previous topics we covered that's going through the whole data engineering roadmap. Um, so if you catch up, you'll, you'll get a lot of uh, great ideas from our speakers um, on various topics. So welcome. Uh, group rules. Uh, if you have a question, just 
ask it, uh, be polite, use that as an opportunity to expand on what the person is talking about. It's a conversation in a community rather than a one-way presentation. Some speakers like you to ask the question on the chat. Please respect that. Our, our company and not, we help professionals build uh, global scale platforms. Uh, specifically, we work in the data and analytics, uh, the real-time data and analytics uh, at a global scale uh, and um, specialize on Cassandra, Spark and Kafka and everything else that makes that happen. Uh, or one of our partners and, and, and uh, sponsors of this group is Datastax. So is the George Washington University. Uh, it's a master's in business analytics. Uh, we have a couple of local sponsors. Not that it costs much to put this on nowadays. Um, and then we have organizational sponsors. Uh, organizational sponsors fund Data Community DC, uh, which you know uh, used to put on in in person events. And uh, if there was a shortfall from a particular group, uh, uh, like let's say our group didn't have enough money, they would pay for pizza and soda in case uh, we ran out of money. Uh, but they also put on uh, tutorials and classes and courses, as well as a conference every year called Data Week DC, which is happening in October. Uh, so there was at least one person looking for work. Anybody else looking for work that has or has jobs available that like that wants to just quickly introduce himself? And you can also share the links in the chat. Okay. All right, great. Um, so a lot of events uh, are available, uh, you know, beyond data engineering on Data Community DC. Um, you can also check out uh, not.us. We have events related to data engineering, such as this one and another one, uh, which is Cassandra Lunch DC. And we do have confirmation on this Prometheus and Grafana chat, um, and that will be followed up by another talk, probably by me, on the Prometheus variants at, at a the large scale Prometheus variants. With that, I will pass it on to Arpin. Arpin, uh, stage is yours. All right, <clears throat> let me go ahead and share my screen. Uh, make sure I'm sharing the right one. <laughs> All right. Can everyone see the slide deck? Perfect. Um, so yeah, as Rahul mentioned, um, I, in, if you have any questions or if you want to add anything uh, to anything I'm saying, uh, you can either drop it in the chat or speak up. I'm not really necessarily picky about it because um, this is a community. So if you have any input, go ahead and speak up. But um, moving back to the topic. So today we're going to take a look at JQ and how we can use it for data engineering. Um, if you're not familiar with what JQ is, JQ is a tool that can be used to slice, filter, map, and transform structured data in the same ease as something like SED and AUK, which we have also covered. Uh, and uh, if you are looking for those, you can find those on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Um JQ is written in C, so it's fast. Um, and typical uses, generally it's for parsing, manipulating JSON data, um, but you can also extract particular fields from an object, convert numbers to strings and various other standard tasks, um, just as a baseline of how it works. Uh, the input, so it can, it can read data as STD in, or you can um, give it a file uh, and it generally parses uh, the input as a sequence of white space separated JSON values, which are then passed through a filter that you put onto it. Um, and then the output of the filter or filters um, are written STD out. So you can ideally pipe something in and then pipe it somewhere else. So say if you're working with said JSON and awk all in the same command, you can pipe something in any order of the three and just move them between the three. Um, and then when it's written out in the, a standard out, it's also uh, sequenced in white space separated JSON. Uh, the nice thing about JQ is it color codes also. Um, so if you're working with super nested uh, JSON data, um, it's really nice where it can help you designate and look at the parent child structure of the object. So the basic syntax of how you write a JQ command, it's JQ followed by any options, so any flags, um, and then within single apostrophes 
are is your program. So within your program, you can have filters, multiple filters. You can have internal pipes. So the pipes that are internal to JQ are a little bit different from like a, a, a single command pipe uh, versus like a single command pipe is STD, STD in, STD out uh, versus JQ's internal within the program is kind of just a way that you can structure the way you're accessing data. Um, so say, take it from the root level and then run this filter on that or uh, potentially as a subset. So like, look at this particular filter of objects. So like, say your key value is like name and you have multiple objects within your JSON array. So then your first filter would be your name and then you can pipe that output internally to another filter you put on top of that. So it's just very robust in terms of the capabilities and functionalities that JQ has. Um, it has a pretty good documentation um, and it's linked in the slide deck. And there's a whole bunch of built-in operators and functions as well. Uh, some of them we'll cover in the demo, but there's just a ton. <laughs> and, uh, it, it, you can do a lot with it. And um, yeah, we'll go ahead and move on to the demo. So oh, let me, so for the demo, I have this GitHub repo. I'll send it in the Slack chat real quick. But essentially we are going to use it to do some basic printing to show you how you can do that with JQ using an input file, STD in, and then outputting it. Uh, how you can do selections um, on specific keys, um, value changes. So if you wanna make value changes, uh, how you can do simple filtering, simple deletions. And then we'll also take a look at like a potential real world application, which is uses a bit more complex programs and operations that you might see in a real world application versus just like, here's this input, this is what you'll get out. But yeah, um, I've spun this up in Gitpod already. And um, I will just be copy and pasting the commands um, from the GitHub repo into the terminal. So you can follow along on the GitHub term repo or um, as we go through this in the terminal. So essentially what we're starting with here in this chorus.json, it's essentially a JSON array of five objects. And the first part of this demo, just like the basic stuffs, we're gonna focus on this and then we'll turn it around and use different data for the more complex um, real world application. But essentially we'll go ahead and get started with uh, basic printing. So this command here, JQ, and then no options on this, but within our program, we use a single period. And what the single period is, it's the uh, most simple expression that you can use in JQ and it essentially designates, take the input and put it as the output with no changes. So it's just saying, take the input, output it. So that's essentially what it did. It took the input of the JSON array and outputted it as necessary. And again, as I mentioned, there's color coding in the output. So it's nice is where you can see the key values um, and the keys are in blue and the values are in green. Uh, numbers are still in white, but generally strings, um, string values are in green. So that's just using the input file and now if we do the same exact thing, I'm actually just gonna make this all the way up. If I can, there we go. And then I'll zoom in a little bit. So then if we use a cat, so if we use the output of a cat on the file and pipe that into JQ, we can do the same exact thing, right? So if we take the STD out of a cat and pipe it in as the STD in, we, we can do the same exact thing we did above without needing an input file. And then there's a couple of uh, basic operators that we can use uh, for JQ. One of them is like length. So if you're, if you're potentially working with data that you don't know the size of, you can run JQ and then within your program, you would just say length. And that would just essentially a function that just runs the length of the array. 
and it gives you back five and we have five objects in our JSON array. So now we can move on to selecting. So selecting is similar in the sense of how you select data using like indexes and then um, keys like with periods or within brackets when you're working with objects. So with this one, what we're saying here is JQ and then in our program, we're saying select position zero, so index zero of the array and give it back to me from the cars.json file. And so this is the first object within that file and it's given, us, given it back to us. Say if we want to select multiple, we can just append it with like a comma or something and say, give us back uh, index two, so the third object and index four, which is the fifth object with from the array in cars.json. So we're able to specifically get back the exact indexed data we want, um, depending on, and then you could potentially, um, sorry, uh, <laughs> the, got distracted by the plane real quick. Um, but essentially you can continue to add on to this as much as you want in terms of filtering. So like if we use an internal pipe here, and we'll get to that a little bit later. Um, but essentially we can say, after we've selected these two, do some other filter on it within the same JQ program. So we'll actually take a look at that now. And another uh, function that we can use is keys. So like if you're working with JavaScript, um, you can get like object.keys, right? And you'll get an array back of the keys of your object. Um, so this does a very similar thing where it gives you, or we say from the array, take the output of that, as we mentioned, internal pipe, and then pipe it into the keys filter. So we're saying take the output of the front or the, the entire array, and then give me the keys back of that. So we see that um, we get back the keys and then we see oh, it's a little unstructured here but essentially within the top level we have car id and location car has a sub uh as a car is its own object as well so we could potentially use this and filter it even further to potentially get nested and so we can do that oh so actually i gotta change this real quick this is the incorrect. You have a pipe between your, um, you don't have another JQ command after your pipe. Yeah, you can do internal. So you can, oh, you can do an internal one. All right, yeah. And so the internal takes a filter on the first part as well. So you can like take the first output. So you run your first filter and then take the output of that, run another filter on it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, you, I, so uh, <laughs> I, forgot to clean this up, but essentially um, this is just a way to uh, select uh, values of keys. So we're saying period of the array, select the values that have the filter of ID as the key. So it gives us back the five different IDs of the keys in the JSON array object. Um, and if we wanna select multiple keys, we can just say, take that, uh, take the output of the first filter, pipe it in, and then give me back the ID and the location of that for each object. So we have the ID and the location of the first object, ID and location of the second object, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And now if you wanna do that same thing for nested objects, what we can say is we can add on to the first filter so we can say, Give me back the, the, um, 
the output from the cars. So look, make a filter and give me back the cars or give me back all the objects that have the key of car and then give me back the sub, um, the sub key values make model in year. So if we ran this, just the first part of this, just to give you a better idea of what we're working with. So right here, this first command gives you back each item at the car level. So whatever matched on the filter. So it contains the, um, the key of car. So this is the sub object of that. So if we take the output of this and then we pipe it in and say, give me back the values of the key make the key model and the key year. And that's exactly what that did here. So it's just a way to do sub filtering uh, using internal pipes, do sub filtering um, on additional nested or just uh, complex JSON you're working with potentially. So now if you wanna do just a quick change of values. So one thing to note about JQ is that it's unlike said, where said you can use the flag I option to do an overwrite of the file you're working with. As far as I know, JQ has no functionality to overwrite the file you're working with, which um, I don't know if that's in development, but from what I've seen online, uh, you can use another tool like sponge to help you overwrite the file. Uh, but internally, JQ has no option to overwrite. Um, so if that's something that you want to keep in mind, you can. But what we'll do with this next example is we'll say, take the output of all the filters that match with the key of location and change those values to Virginia Beach. So what we're saying here is take find the location or find the objects with location and those values, set it equal to Virginia Beach. So what we do here is in this array, the IDs are all still different and then the cars are all still different. However, we've changed the location for each individual object to become Virginia Beach and we still retain the rest of the data. So if that's something you're working with, say if you have some dead data and you need to do some data cleaning and you notice nulls or um, just unformatted data, or if you need to format a certain way for a specific key in a JSON, you can potentially use this, right? So say if like you're working with something that has, if you're working like in a dealership and for like 500 of your thousand cars, the, uh, the make, or the location is wrong, right? So you can potentially use JQ real quick, like call an API that gives you back data, make these changes, convert it to a CSV, or you can still keep it as JQ and use another tool that would use importing of JSON and put it back in your database. So now we can uh, move on to using uh, a method called select it's essentially another way to do filters. Um, so with JQ, there's a couple of different ways you can do selections and modifications based on filters. So you could use like a map, a reduce. Um, so like a lot of JavaScript functions that you might be familiar with if you know JavaScript. Uh, for this one, we'll be using select to do additional filtering. So what we're saying here is take the object levels from car and then pipe that into this next filter, which says select any value of the key make that is equal to Buick. And so we only get back one because out of the five objects we have in the, um, in the cars.json, only one is a Buick. And if we do the same exact thing, instead of using a string operator that says equal to some something specific, if you, you wanna use like a date range operator, you can say select and then use the value of year and then give me back any car that's older than 2000 
or that was manufactured in 2000, whatever that year value means to you. Um, but essentially anything that's more recent than 2000 and we get back two values because two of the five objects were either created, et cetera, et cetera, after the year of 2000. And so that's just the way you can kind of do like SQL like um, selections on potentially J, uh, JSON data if you need to be very specific in what you're searching for. Excuse me. So now we'll take a look at um, deleting. So deleting um, is fairly simple. Uh, you would just use the, the, the delete method, D-E-L specifically. And then the parameters you pass into that are the path to the keys that you want to delete. So what we're saying here is, uh, what we're saying here is JQ delete, and we give it the path of the ID. So delete all the key values of ID from cars JSON. So for now, if we look at the output of that, we see that there's only location and car left. So we've deleted ID from each and every single object. You could potentially, if you wanted, you could have an internal pipe that then also deletes like cars model or cars make because you've already gotten back the output from this first part. But there's also another option where you can delete multiple paths within the delete function. Um, I forget exactly, I think it's called DEL paths is the function name. Uh, might be wrong on that, but there is a way to delete multiple key values. Um, otherwise, um, you could do what we just said and we can delete it with an internal pipe. So what we're saying here, if I can find it, is we're saying delete the cars year and then take the output of that and then also delete the cars make. So then what we get back is only ID, location, and then within the car object, we only have model, right? Because we've deleted year and make versus the original, which has make, model, and year. We've created an internal pipe that runs two filters on the data and deletes two separate key value pairs. All right. That will cover some of the basics. Again, JQ is pretty extensive in terms of the capabilities. So I definitely recommend checking out their documentation uh, because you can do a lot with it and it's pretty powerful. Um, but now we'll move on to the uh, potential real world application. So I kind of got a little um, inspiration. Uh, so, sorry, um, give it a second planes are passing over okay um so i don't know if not if everyone watches sports but uh the mlb season recently started up uh, and if you're any familiar with baseball or if you're not very familiar with it um nowadays data is heavily ingrained in professional sports but baseball especially with saber metrics uh and on that github repo there there's like a link of just offensive statistics that people potentially use within an organization or a team. Um, and nowadays baseball is very heavily relied on statistics, even so, even more so like of how you position players on your field, depending on what pitch is being thrown. So all of that comes back from data, right? So what is, what is the probability of you throwing this pitch against this specific batter? What is the likely outcome of it? So people use data for that. And this is potentially something that you might see, I don't know specifically, but um, just a real world example that potentially may be used. Um, so what we're gonna start with is, is we're going to get back um, the roster of the Phillies. Um, and then there's a couple things we can do with this. Uh, I'm just showing you this. I'm not actually gonna use it in terms of moving forward the demo, but these are just another two uh, operators that you can use. So there's the sort by and group by. So using sort by, um, we'll show you how you can sort by like a position. So with baseball, there's nine positions, right? And then you can sort by a specific key. And then what JQ does, it compares two elements 
by comparing the result of the sort by for each element. So if we run this, and so what we're saying here, if I can find where I started it, if it shows me, okay. So it's, it's a 40 man roster. So I'm just gonna point up to get back to the last command. So essentially what we're saying here is we're sort by and then the key we're sorting by is position.txt. So if we look back at the JSON response, we see that their position is designated by position.txt. And then we're saying sort that from the JSON we just created with the curl command. So if we just scroll up, we see short stop, short stop, right field, pitcher, pitcher. So we only have one right fielder, so there's a bunch of pitchers. And if we keep scrolling, we'll eventually get to like, first base, second base, et cetera. So that's just a sort by. We could also do a similar thing that does group by. But the thing is with group by, it takes the elements um, that are grouped together and it creates an array of those groups. So you would have all the pitchers within a subarray. You would have all the first basemen under a subarray, um, all the um, et cetera, et cetera. For each position, you would have a subarray of all the people that were grouped together. So if we run this group by command, we see that there's the overarching JSON array, but then we have this subarray of short stops. So we have two, or no, we have three. So we have three short stops, and then that's one subarray. And then there's another subarray of just right fielders, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so those are just a couple methods where you can potentially use sort by or group by depending on what you're trying to do. So if you take an input of either JSON data or some kind of stream, so like Kafka, you can use JSON for the, um, depending on if it's like Avro serialized or not, um, if it's just straight JSON, you could potentially put this into some kind of formatting. So take JSON, not use KSQL, um, and then do some operations on it and then put it back into your pipeline in your ETL pipeline. So what, we're doing now to move the demo forward is we're going to filter out the pictures um, and we're going to use the select method that we've used before. And then we're also going to use an option called slurp. So the, what slurp is, it's flag lowercase s. Um, it essentially takes the input stream and puts it together into an array. So when we run this, what we're saying here is take the entire array, internally pipe that into the select function. So select where the key value of positions.txt is equal to pitchers from the phillies.json, and then externally pipe that back into a new JQ command that slurps it, so it slurps it up like a straw, and then it uses this period filter. So essentially, remember what we said about period, it takes the input and does nothing with it and puts it as the output. So what this does is this first half returns you back just a list of objects. And then the slurp takes that list of objects and then puts them into an array, back into a JSON array. So now if we look at pictures.json, well, we should only have pictures, right? So if I just do a quick search on this position.txt, um, we have 23. So if we look back at phillies.json and we run that again, um, positions.txt, we have 40. So it's a 40 man roster. Of that 40 man roster, we have filtered out 23 pictures. So now using that, uh, let's create a CSV. So what we're doing here, pull this up, is we're saying JQ, excuse me, lowercase flag R means just output, the output as raw and not as like JSON formatted, just put it output as it raw because we're converting to uh, CSV, right? Cause CSV is just raw line data. Uh, and then we're using lowercase F because we're using a script file. So with JQ, you can use script files and we'll talk about a little bit about what that script file does in a second. And then we're saying, take the pictures JSON that we created with the select filter and then write it into a CSV called pictures.csv. 
So if we look at the script file called to csv.jq, what this does is it says it runs a map using the keys. It puts the, it adds, so essentially appending them and then make sure it's unique. So get rid of any duplicates and then use that as the columns and then do the same thing for map for rows. Um, and then put those corresponding values. So essentially, you know, like a CSV, so you have your header row and you have, um, so it's essentially like shifting the JSON from um, a nested structure to the key and then the value, the key, the value, the key, the value. And so it's with the map, it's setting that structure up. So that way you have column one, column two, column three, and then their values are um, the ones we, or the ones that get pulled from the JSON. And then we're saying, uh, put the column names before the column rows as so it would be the header, uh, and then pass that row stream into the CSV filter. And then that will output your uh, data as CSV. So then if we look at pictures.csv, we have a ton of data. So we have bats. And so from the JSON, so if we look at pictures.json, we see bats here, so bats left. And if we look back at the CSV, we see bats left. Not necessarily it's a specific row, but it's we're looking at that the JSON correctly converted from JSON to CSV and then the columns and the values of the key values stayed together. So then we have birthday, college, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Not all pitchers go to college. If you're familiar with baseball, a lot of people are drafted out of high school and then go into the farm system. But essentially, um, let's look at birth date. So we see it's in uh, date time format and then we see that it's in date time format. So now what we can do with this is say, you're either playing against the Phillies or you're playing for the Phillies. So in the case of it's a series, so baseball is generally played in series. So you have three game series generally. So you have three pitchers of your five pitcher starting pitcher rotation. So we'll start with our SP one or our starting pitcher and then SP two, SP three. So if you're playing against the Phillies, you're playing for the Phillies. These are the three pitchers you're going to face one for each day. Um, as the starter. So what we're going to do is we're going to make a couple, we're going to make a couple curl calls to this just because, just because it's a free API um, I'm working with that gives me back this data. So essentially what we're doing here is we're, um, we are uh, curling the API and then we're taking the output of the API and then we're running some JQ on it. So what this JQ is doing is, um, I'll show you what the curl looks like um, in a second, but essentially is we're saying, take the, the parent key value and then take the parent key or the, the child of that, that is the parent of the data we actually want. So we, we're trying to access third level nested data as the data we really want. So what we're doing with this is we're saying, filter that data through and give us back only the data that comes back as the key value of row. So if I just run this curl call, uh, let me paste it from here. Okay, so we see that there's an overarching key value and then the data we're looking for is over here. So if we follow the trail, we see that it's under row here, right? So there's a row and then row is a child of query results. So following that trail from the data we want. So we need the data that comes back. We need the value of the row key of the data we uh, curled. So we need to access row and then from row, the parent of row is query results. So we need to include that in our J JQ parser. And then the parent of query results is sport career pitching. 
So then we, that essentially helps us isolate the exact data we want coming back from like a JSON response. So now if we just go ahead and get back the, the data for the, the next two pictures as well. All right. So now we have this NOLA.json, this FLIN.json, and this Wheeler.json. So it's essentially just their career data. So they've, um, let's see what's a good easy value to see, um, earned runs. So over their entire career, they've given up 328 earned runs. And so we have this for three different pitchers. So the pitcher will face on day one, the pitcher will face on day two, and the pitcher will face on day three. So if we look at the data here, we see that, hmm, the name's not really there. So how would the team member that we're giving this data back to know that this data is their data? So we can use JQ to add key values into our JSON object. So what we can do for Aranola is we'll say JQ, take the key, full name, set it equal to Aranola, and because it doesn't exist, it'll add it, right? Because when you're working with ob objects in JavaScript, you can set keys equal to values and just say object that this key that doesn't exist is now this. So we did that same exact thing and then we used the NOLA.json and then we just did some, because again, JQ doesn't have the ability to overwrite. We'd have to do some work around. So we say, make a temp file and then overwrite it with the move. So then we'll do the same exact thing for the other, other two pictures. And so now if we look back at NOLA.json, we now see his full name. And if we look back at Eflin.json, we'll see his full name and we'll see Wheeler.json. We now see their full names. So now we need to combine all of this data from three different JSON files into one JSON file. So we can use, we can, oh, no, what did I just do? Okay. And we can use JQ to do that. And so what we'll say here is JQ, remember Slurp, what we did with Slurp is we, um, took objects and we put them into an array. So if we look at the export here, so it's just a plain object. So instead of using one single output, we're using three different files, but slurp can still do that. So we're saying JQ slurp, take the input output from nola.json, efflin.json, and wheeler.json, and then write that into a JSON called rotation.json. So if we look at rotation.json, it should be a JavaScript, <coughs> sorry, an array of JSON objects. So if we look at rotation.json, that JQ, you slurped, it took three different objects from three different files and it slurped them into one array with three objects. So we see the first object here, we see the second object here, and we see the third object there. And now, we can use that same exact um, script file that we used before to turn this into a CSV. So we just use lowercase r, lowercase f, designate it's a file, use rotation.json, and then write it to a rotation.csv. So if we now look at rotation.csv, this is data that we can hand back to our team or back to the either if you're facing the Phillies or if you're playing with the Phillies. I'm just gonna open this in a CSV viewer just so it's a little easier to read. So potentially someone, a data analyst or a data science on our team can input this into a machine learning model or they can put it on some BI tool and say, hey, okay, uh, potentially, so their, their walks per nine innings, they generally give up three, right? Um, let's look at something else. So if their ERA is generally three to four, um, there is another stat I looked at. Uh, so how many hits they give per nine innings? So if we're playing a team that hits really well, we might need to make some defensive adjustments for that. Or um, home runs per nine innings. 
So they generally give about one or less home runs per nine innings, so we don't really have to worry about the long ball. So they're more likely to cause balls to be hit into the ground. Um, Ks per nine inning, they average around eight or nine strikeouts per nine innings. Um, let's see, uh, walks per – or strikeouts per walk. So their strikeouts per walk ratio is relatively good. Um, see, okay, here's another one, RS9. So RS9 is generally run support per nine innings. So their ERA, right, was around three or four. And then the offense for the Phillies generally gives the support of around five runs per game. So generally just looking at over their careers, they get enough runs to win a game if they pitch like they normally do per their career. But again, look, just like looking through this data, there's all this different data that teams use just for making decisions per pitch, per person, per game. So I wanted to give like a little bit of real world where we could potentially use JQ to take JSON data, format it, give it back to a data analyst or a data engineer or data scientist who could potentially use this and make ins or physical insight or not physical insight, critical insight into how it might affect an actual game. But yeah, that will wrap up my presentation. Um, and the floor is open to any questions or if anyone has any input that I didn't necessarily cover, um, they can go ahead. Hey, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Hey, yeah, good, good presentation. Um, yeah, there's actually uh, another tool that I compared uh, JQ2 uh, like a long time ago. It's called Jolt, J-O-L-T, and it's a Java library um, where you can do kind of similar things where you give it a JSON, you give it like a spec, um, and then there's like an output that it'll give you. And um, it could do things like um, transpose, uh, or it could rename, or it could flatten hierarchies and things like that. You just have to know the syntax. Um, and I like did a comparison between like a hundred megabytes of JSON data in Java and then hundred megabytes with JQ, but it was Java um, running both the, the Jolt class and running the same data through the command line using like, you know, uh, the command basically run, like saving the file, running it. And JQ was always faster. Just like, it was just like nothing. Um, and as you got bigger and bigger files, like it was, it was just no comparison at all. I think, I think at the 100, 100 megabyte, 50 megabyte mark, I think, you know, Java was fine. Even at the 100 megabyte mark, I think it was just, com it was much faster, but it wasn't like that much faster. Um, maybe I just didn't have enough heap memory, but like I could just imagine with JQ, if you have enough memory, you could, you could run like massively huge uh, JSON files through it and it wouldn't be any, any problem. So yeah, definitely. Learned a few interesting syntactical things, but very good. Glad you did this presentation. Thank you. Some, well, uh, if there aren't any other questions, um, can JQ be used for streaming data? That's a good question, uh, Bob. Um, streaming data from where? The streams could be from a variety of sources. Uh, so basically, we're thinking about <clears throat> situations where right now I'm a Python programmer and I kind of like using the JSON library. So generally what happens with that, you uh, load an entire JSON file in um, memory, but we anticipate cases where we have much more data than uh, memory. So we're looking at streaming solutions like iJSON in, in Python. Um, to, to deal with cases like that. Um, right, so it, is, where is the stream originating from? Like, is it coming in the, 
are you something that is something that you're downloading from the web or is it coming in like a Kafka queue or um, when you mean when you mean stream like I'm just trying to really narrow down where the stream is originating where's the data being uh, originated well right now we're focused on AWS so uh, we were we're talking about AWS uh, objects mm -hmm. so we would put enormous amounts of data in s3 which is, is designed for but then we would run the actual processing of the data in EC2 instances or Lambda functions or something like that, which are limited in memory. So looking at cases where the memory is smaller than the actual S3 data objects. Oh, okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so no, no, and this is just my kind of experience. Normally when we're talking about streaming, there's like, everybody has like streaming and they use it interchangeably, at least in my experience, like when you're talking about ingesting a massive file that's not um well right i think you're talking about kind of near real time where you have an infinite sized uh stream yeah. of data that runs yeah it's like an unbounded seven. array exactly it's an unbounded uh data set that just keeps coming and that uh right. generally each data um or each datum rather is is a, is a it's a it's in a particular series of 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 uh, events almost, right? It's like coming in. So in that case, you know, um, like if you take a look at a JSON file, if it's massive, you can break it up into small chunks. Like if it's an array, you can break it up into small chunks and basically send it to a stream. And um, I know at least on the Unix command line, streams, streams work fine. Um, but when you're talking about like you have a massive file, you have to break it apart into a stream before you can put it into JQ. I think that's really what my understanding is. Arpin, what, what is that that you sent on here? What is this? Yeah, um, let me I can share my screen again if needed. Um, open it up. <clears throat> so if, if you're working with just like, as you were talking about, because like streaming, like that's what I was like, when I think streaming, I think more like, Spark Kafka message streaming. Um, but if you're working with streams in terms of very large data, um, make sure I'm sharing the right screen. Okay, um, so this is just something I saw in the manual. So it looks like if you're working with like a large stream, so if like you have a single JSON that's greater than one gig, it recommends using like the stream option and you can like convert to stream, I guess. Yeah, so they're, they're converting it for you such that it could be broken apart and then processed further on. Nice. Okay, yeah, that's helpful. We'll study that further right now. Thanks. Yeah, this, this is your best bet. Basically it's putting it, you probably still need a lot of uh, uh, I don't know if it, Lambda will work because Lambda has a short time limit, right? So um, might consider running it. Um, there's this Lambda on Docker. And uh, basically it's syntactically, it's the same thing. You can use any Lambda language, but uh, what it does is it, it runs on Docker. So you can run Docker on, uh, you know, ECS, which is their Elastic Container Service and have that as a long running process. You don't even have to get into the whole Spark world. You just bring it up and it'll just keep doing the work and until it's done, right? And so a Docker container doesn't end until the command that you're running is done. So if you have an infinite stream or not infinite, just massive, it'll just do its job and then it'll be done and it'll, then it'll just go away. And so you're only charged for the container runtime on there. Interesting question. Very good question, I like that. Okay. Thanks. Excellent. Any other questions? Okay, well, we're at the top of the hour. Uh, the, we love your company. Um, happy to see some faces and familiar, uh, at least familiar icons and avatars. Um, we'll see you guys next week, same time, same place for Data Engineers Lunch. Take care guys, bye-bye.